I did. Because I have extra. Hello? Oh, I can hear me. No problem. That we're working with at this point. In case, in case, maybe, in case we bring up, hey, we might need to have a session meeting that day. So you're already briefed on what that'll be, and there'll be a more concrete plan moving forward. Yeah, I cut it off right after the pandemic started. Yeah, it's been a while. Hey, boy. Yeah. Remember Jake the Snake? Yeah. DDC. Right there, Jake. The his his real name. Bad dude, man. I have extra copies just because I You'd have 20 seconds. That ain't happening. It's faster. We picked it up so it doesn't sound like a dirge. A dirge. Yeah. I heard quite a few people who were like, it's so slow and it feels like such a weird way to start worship. And I'm like, we'll speed it up until enough people complain that we can't stop. <laughs> Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels wings in glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Good morning. It is wonderful to see your smiling faces in worship today. How many of you got rain last night? 
Wasn't it wonderful? Yes, this morning Kevin and I were going down a street where the bridge was closed because so much debris, don't go by the round rock just so you'll know, so much debris had washed up that they'd closed the bridge. I didn't realize it rained that hard last night. But what a wonderful blessing from God. Well, you are a blessing from God that you have joined with us in worship today. And those of you who are joining us online and out on the front porch, we would really love to know that you're here. Now, if you're in person, there's a register tablet you can sign. Or if you're online, there's a QR code that you can uh, use to let us know that you're here. And we'd really appreciate it. Now, you may be wondering about this football. That really is a football. I've heard some people don't think it looks like a football, but... We did our best, and um, um, you see people's names on it. Well, last week was our rally day, and we challenged people to be part of God's team here at Grace, and if you wanted to be part of God's team, you were invited to sign the football. You know how teams sign team balls, and so uh, there are still these white pins up here. If you missed last Sunday and you want a sign that you are a part of God's team here at Grace, we would love to invite you to do that. Now, next Sunday is what we call, well, it, I don't call it, it is the first Sunday of the month, but <laughs> we call it first Sunday because we do two things. We celebrate communion, and as we celebrate to be fed by God, we think about feeding others in our community. And so we collect items for the Round Rock Area Serving Center. Now, this month we're not collecting food, but we're collecting toilet paper and paper towels. That is a huge need. And so uh, if you look at all that toilet paper that's here, wow, you did great today. If next Sunday you bring more, and then we will take it to the Round Rock Area Serving Center. Um, Youth Fellowship begins this Thursday night at 6 o'clock with a meal that's open to all kids in 6th grade and 12th grade. Canon is back there going, yes, it is fun, isn't it, Canon? Yes. <laughs> and they have asked for adults in the congregation to sponsor a meal, which means you just sign up and you bring a meal at 6 o'clock, and then you share that meal with the kids. And it's a wonderful way to get to know the kids, and then they go off and do their thing. You don't have to stay for, you know, playing Gaga. We won't make you jump up and down in the Gaga pit. <laughs> so we'd love for all youth to join us. Now today a new Sunday school class started at 9 a.m. with Jane and Connie teaching Habits for Holiness, Small Steps for Making Big Spiritual Progress. So I encourage you to join us at 9 a.m. in 5A for this great class. Now today after worship, we're starting something new. We're having fellowship after worship with coffee and water and sweet treats on the patio. And so we encourage you to um, stay and visit with old friends and make new friends. And just a reminder, I know all you elders know this, immediately following worship today, we have a session meeting in 5A. So let us now join together in our call to worship. Jesus taught us that when we give a banquet, we should invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Here we are, in more ways than one, we are poor, crippled, lame, and blind. Jesus welcomes all of you to this place of worship. The invitation stretches far and wide, from wilderness and wandering, from loneliness and longing, all have a place at the table. There is more than enough love to go around. Joy is ours for the taking, and peace is poured out in abundance. With great thanksgiving, let us worship God. Isn't that right? With great thanksgiving, let us worship God. Let us stand together as we sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Oh 
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. For this pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pain. When the darkness closes in light, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their house, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. God's holy wisdom. God's holy wisdom. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare, you're our living hope, your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone in your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the Oh 
nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and of the sweetest of love where my heart becomes free and my shame is path of faithfulness is the past of humility. Let us bow before the God who created us and confess the sins that betray us and our faith. Let us join together in prayer. Merciful God, your patience is more than we deserve, for our priorities are so often confused. You invite us to your table of life and love and rather than running full tilt, we hesitate. We consult our calendars and weigh our options. We consider who may be in attendance or we question whether we really belong. Forgive us, God, for not always knowing what is best for us and forgive us when we know but still choose otherwise. Show us once again what faithfulness looks like. Hear now our silent prayers to you. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God says to you and to me, do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven and freed, amen. Now, 
All children four years old through fifth grade are invited to meet Libby <laughs> for Holy Moly Kids Club. And they're going to go to the church house uh, and do some Bible lessons and crafts. And please, as a reminder, pick up your children after worship. <laughs> Thank you. Please stand and join us in glory be to the Father. Let us pray. Eternal God, your word speaks truth into our lives. When we humble ourselves to listen, you strengthen our faith. Open us to your word, read and proclaimed today, so that we might hear and embrace the message you intend for us. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor. In case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, Go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they might invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repair it repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I have a confession to make. When I get an Evite, I usually look to see who else is invited. Anybody with me? Okay, yeah, lots. Now, in case you don't know what an Evite is, this is an electronic invitation that comes through your email. So when you open your browser and you see your list of emails, there will be a line that says, you've received an Evite. And when you click on that, you will see an invitation to some kind of event with all the details about that event and a place to RSVP, and you can also see the entire guest list, which I really love. I mean, how many times have you gotten a hard copy wedding invitation and 
especially if it's out of town, and you, you, you don't know who else is invited, and you love to carpool, but you don't want to ask anybody, because if you ask them and they say, well, no, I wasn't invited, then that's kind of embarrassing, you know, and so, um, but with an evite, you can just scroll through that guest list and see the entire list, and then you'll know ahead of time if this is going to be an event where you will know people, or it's going to be all strangers. Uh, you can make a prediction if there will be lots of awkward silences or good conversations, and this prediction might actually help you determine whether you will av a attend the event. But you know, sometimes the sender turns off that list so you can't see who was invited. Yeah, you're going, yep. Don't you hate that? And then I have to wonder, why did they not want me to see who else was invited? Yeah. But what is it about human nature that has us wanting to spend time with those we know and like instead of those we don't know? Maybe it's because we're insecure, or maybe it's because we're self-centered, or, or maybe you're afraid if we're around people who aren't like us, they might challenge our understanding of the world. But Jesus is a master at challenging us to a great reversal, a reversal of our thoughts and actions and our relationships. And he does it again today when we meet up with him at the home of a Pharisee for a meal on the Sabbath. Now, in the first portion that Connie read, the appetizers haven't even been served yet when he challenges everyone at the meal to look at where they're sitting and how they've been jockeying for positions of power. Now, you may remember I preached on that portion of the scripture last spring and remember that Jesus said, all those uh, who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Well, today we're going on to the next portion and so after insulting all of those people around the table, now Jesus turns to the host and he gives a challenge. And he says, when you give a luncheon or dinner, don't invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors like those who are sitting around this table right here uh, in case they might invite you in return and you'd be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. The poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Now, it's important for us to realize that for the ancient Hebrews, uh, they believed that anybody who had challenges either physically or emotionally or financially were being uh, punished by God for some sin in their life. So their excuse for not socializing with these people was, you know, that sin might rub off on them or they might be unclean and not be able to go to temple for worship. And then, you know, these people couldn't repay the invitation, so why waste their time? But you know, Jesus was always eating with folks who were on the outside. He ate with tax collectors and sinners, which really upset the religious establishment. He ate with lepers and disturbed everybody who knew anything about diseases and cleanliness and that you could catch this disease if you were near them. And Jesus was like, doesn't matter. He even ate with women who had a poor reputation. His whole ministry was focused on reaching out to the other. And he does it again in the story right after the one we read today because then he goes on to tell another parable in which he says, go out into the streets and the lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Seems like he keeps talking about the same people. But you know, isn't that what he told us his ministry was all about when he first started? When he stood up for the very first time to preach at his hometown synagogue, he read from the prophet Isaiah. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then when he finished reading that, he closed and said, Today... The scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and shocked everyone who was sitting there. But he was announcing his mission right then and there. He was saying um, that his mission was about reaching out to those that were considered outsiders. And a passage that Connie read, he talks about those same people. So in the first half of Luke's gospel, up through chapter 14, Three times he has said that we are supposed to extend love and grace to those who are outside the norm of our cultural and social um, standards. 
Jesus says those are the people with whom we should be breaking bread, not our buddies. It's interesting to note when he first talks about when you give a meal, when he says when you give a lunch or dinner, um, the word that is used there uh, is the word for a very casual meal. But he changes that word when he talks about extending to the invitation those who are not a part of the in crowd. And he used the word banquet or feast. Maybe what he's saying that what could have been a simple meal becomes a banquet or feast when we welcome all to the table. It's a celebration where all are welcome and there are no strings attached. It's kind of interesting how often Jesus has to remind the Hebrews about showing hospitality because from the very beginning of the scriptures, there was a hospitality code that was written into everything. They had a long history of being told to extend hospitality to strangers. In the biblical tradition, hospitality was giving friendship to someone you did not know. The literal meaning of the word hospitality is love of a stranger isn't that interesting hospitality means love of a stranger not just having people over to dinner that are your best buddies it's uh, someone whose life or convictions or past is strange to us so hospitality meant a process of receiving outsiders and changing them from strangers to guests and for guests to members of the community. No longer are they strangers or outsiders, but they're members of the family and a vital part of the community. Now, let me stop and say it wasn't that the Hebrews did not care for those in need. They had strict, strict rules about caring for the poor and those who needed help. Um, according to the law of Moses, they had to be given alms. And uh, the Levitical code said that the Levites had to keep supplies so that they could give to the poor. And they had rules about gleaning, which was where they had to leave a percentage of the crops, the outside of the crops when they were harvesting, so that people didn't have means could come and pick up that food and eat. So they cared about those who were in need, but there's still two classes, the ones who have and the ones who have not. And those who have not received welfare from those who had. But Jesus says, no, everybody is in one group. There are not two classes. We're all together. You know, Jesus was always talking about how the kingdom of heaven was breaking in here and now. And sharing meals was a foretaste of what that would be. I don't think it's any accident that in our worship area that one of the central pieces of furniture is our communion table and that in our tradition we celebrate Holy Communion very regularly. And if you think about it, the words that are said most often at the beginning of communion is they will come from north and south and east and west and sit at table in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, that was foreign to the Jews because they thought it was only about the nation of Israel. And God's saying, it's about every corner of the earth, which means it's about every culture, every social class, everybody is going to sit at table together. So the question for us today is, can we share that foretaste of the kingdom with others here and now? You know, honestly, it will take a real reversal of our attitudes and motivations. Are we willing to share meals with strangers so that we become equals at the table? Can we take the time to get to know others, really discovering what, the, what things excite them about their life and what things challenge them? Are, willing, are we willing to set aside distinctions or do we just want to have a service project? And, you know, we are really good at helping others, I think. You know, we reach out to those in need. You know, we, we give money to those in need. We give backpacks to people. We give gift cards. We give, we go and feed the homeless. But they're still, a, they're staying where they are, and we're right here. Think about the times you've been to a soup kitchen. There's typically some kind of wall and a counter. 
and there are people on one side with gloves and aprons and hats that are serving the trays and handing it through the window, and then there are the people on the other side who come up and get the tray, and then they go sit down at a table. Now, there are exceptions because I have seen people here at Grace get a tray and go sit with homeless people and have a conversation. But for the most part, most of us, when we do that, we serve the people and we say nice things to them through the window, but we don't sit down with them and really get to know them. How often do we take time to break bread with somebody and really get to know someone who's outside of our circle? How often do we invite a homeless person to live with us? I heard a statistic that said that if every home in this country invited one homeless person to live with them, we would not have a problem with homelessness at all. How often do we walk along someone who's unemployed and encourage them and help them to find a job or maybe even give them a job? You see, it's not just about feeding the hungry, which is very important. It's important that we collect things and take it and give to people. And it's not just about writing a check to cover the cost of food or whatever, although that's critical to addressing the need. But it's about developing a real relationship. It's about realizing we're no different. You may remember when we had our first dinner with the tornado, uh, folks affected by the tornado, uh, I told many of you when you came that your only job was to sit down and talk to people and just say, tell me what happened. And I had to write up a report to send to the Presbytery and the Synod about what we did because they gave us some money. And the person wrote back and said, I'm so excited to know that you realize the most important thing is not about giving them money, but it's about building relationships. Jesus called us to build relationships. And you know, we need to realize that we're no different because we are all broken. It's just that our brokenness shows up in different ways. If we're honest, we know we're all spiritually crippled by our sin or our woundedness. We're lame and unable to walk to God on our own because we carry all this bitterness and anger and doubt and it's so heavy. Or we're spiritually blind when we don't recognize that Jesus is present in our midst, especially in the face of the stranger. As John wrote in Revelation, and just a side here, this is Kevin's pet peeve. It is the book of Revelation, singular, not Revelations, plural. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ to John, just so you'll know that. But in Revelation, John wrote, for you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing, not even realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. We all come with emotional, mental, and spiritual challenges. And yet God invites us to the great feast. A feast where we share love and encouragement and nourishment. I recently read an article in Presbyterian Outlook, which is a publication of the Presbyterian Church USA, about a man whose name was Kevin Finch. And he had been in the restaurant industry for years before he felt a call to go into ministry. Now, having been involved in that industry for years, he knew that one of the great ironies of the industry is although it is the industry that offers hospitality time and time and time again, the people who actually work in the industry are some of the most overlooked people in our culture. The wait staff, the dishwashers, the hotel maids, the janitors, and the line chefs. He wrote, our industry, the restaurant and hospitality industry, is full of amazing and gifted people. These hardworking people have a significantly increased risk for financial and emotional crisis as compared to other industries. In fact, every one of the 10 lowest paid jobs in the country, based on 2020 statistics, are in the restaurant and hospitality industry. Yet because hospitality workers are naturally required to keep smiles on their faces, their needs are virtually invisible to the world. Their job is to serve and take care of others. It is an industry where drug and alcohol use is high. Um, it's an industry where people live at or close to the poverty level. They are juggling ever-changing schedules and covering down on ever-rotating um, employees. Now, this is not every restaurant or every um, 
place. But on the whole, Kevin Finch says that this industry is the number one catch basin for the most vulnerable in our world. Think about the people that served you in a restaurant. Do you take time to ask them how their day is going? Do you get to know, you know, <laughs> years ago I used to go to Taco Cabana like every morning for breakfast. And one time the guy gave me a Christmas card. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, but we just had short little conversations. So then I started having more conversations with him because I realized that he considered me a friend. He knew my name. He knew, you know, and I thought, gosh, all he does is hand food out the window. He doesn't have relationships. Well, this man, Kevin Finch, created what he calls Big Tables. And it's a mission outreach to walk alongside those in this industry who need it most. And now there are mission outreaches in Nashville and San Diego and Spokane, Washington. Began in Spokane. And in those cities, every three or so weeks, Big Tables host a huge multi-course dinner at a really big, elegantly set table for 48 people. And who does he invite? The hotel maids and restaurant servers and the line chefs and the dishwashers. And the cook... Well, Kevin invites one of the top chefs in that city to serve up their absolute best feast. And then at one point in the meal, uh, someone from uh, Big Table shares their vision of uh, wanting to reach out and walk beside these folks and be good neighbors, to be friends with them, and to help others that they know. So they're asked to write down the name of somebody they know in the industry who is in need and they leave it in the center of the table and then they collect all those pieces of paper and between that and the next meal they coordinate ways to reach out so what happens uh, what happened recently was that uh, a dad was delivered diapers a single dad groceries were taken to a 19 year old teenager who works three shifts at a restaurant a car was loaned to a single mom who was trying to make it to work on time while shuttering her three kids to and from school while she worked two different shifts in a restaurant. They have helped someone to get more education with better benefits. They have walked with folks during COVID. One of the people they walked with was sick with COVID for 81 days. Obviously lost their job and uh, had a lot of financial issues and they've been walking with him, helping him to get healthy and find a job where he can work because he does not have the energy after being ill for that long. Standing with uh, several people as they deal with their addictions and move towards a life of sobriety. You know, all of that starts with a meal that is shared among those who go get, are overlooked or uninvited that are probably the closest to most meals that are served. And the reason they only have 48 seats because they have people from their ministry who are also sitting and talking with these people and getting to know them and developing a relationship and finding out what's going on in their life. You see, it's not about just a project where one meal is served. It's forming relationships, making friends, and walking together. Just so you know, part of our mission dollars goes to Big Tables. It is a project that the Peace USA supports. Uh, Kevin Finch went to the Peace USA, wrote a grant, and he got uh, a lot of grant money. And when you give money to Grace, part of our money goes to help this very ministry. You know, if we stop and think about it, we were all outsiders at one time because, I don't know, I don't think anybody here is Hebrew, Right? And yet Jesus came and welcomed us. In fact, he looked and saw us and was willing to become one of us. And he showed us through his life that we are to sit at table with everybody, not just our kind. So I challenge you this day. Open your eyes. Open your eyes to the people you see every day, whether it's at the grocery store or a restaurant, or where you get your coffee every morning, or your taco at Taco Cabana, and build a relationship with them. Invite them to share in a feast. Share a meal with them. Can you imagine how a restaurant worker would feel if you said, hey, can I meet you after work and take you to a different restaurant where you work, and let's just get to know each other? 
Now, it's risky, right? But think what God risked for us. May we share his love with others in very tangible ways. And then may we all feast at the banquet table. Let us pray together. Gracious and most holy God, it is really easy for us to overlook folks around us. And it's so easy to just get comfortable with the people we know and settle into an easy life. But you have challenged us to look outside ourselves and look outside our own group of people and reach out to the world. So give us the courage to do that and open our minds to the great possibilities before us. May we be part of extending invitation to all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As a people who believe that God has welcomed us, I invite you now to stand if you're able and affirm with me what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and released to the captives, teaching by word and deed, and blessing the children, healing the sick, and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raises Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. It's a beautiful thing to see some of our imperfections and um, know that our worship, although we put effort in, is imperfect, but God's arms are still open for us. And um, there is an altar where the Father's arms are open wide.
precious blood of Jesus It is always a delight when we welcome new people into this church family. Connor, will you come stand down here at the front? Now, as he's walking down here, you're probably going, what? Connor's a member of this church. <laughs> you know, Connor has been coming to Grace since he was in elementary school, and he has been very involved in the life of the church, and somehow, I don't know what happened, he just didn't ever join the church. And recently he asked for a name tag, and I looked it up, and I said, Connor, you're not a member of the church. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I want to join the church. He's very, Connor's very active. You know, he helps us every year with Vacation Bible School. He's very instrumental in helping our new young adults group get started. So we're excited that we can actually <laughs> welcome you officially into the church family at Grace, even though we kind of consider him already a member of the church family at Grace. So, Connor, I'm going to ask you the questions of membership that you answered for the session. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, say, I do. Do you intend to be his disciple, obey his word, and show his love? If so, say, I do. I do. And will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself, and will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? If so, say, I will. I will. And now I ask you, family of Grace Presbyterian Church, do you welcome Connor fully into the life of this church to share in ministry and discipleship together, and do you promise to share the good news of the gospel with him? Do you? We do. Yay, let's pray. <laughs> Gracious God, we thank you so much for Connor, for his faith, for his life, for his willingness to serve you. God, be with him and help us find new and creative ways of joining hands of ministry together here in this place. We thank you and praise you. Amen. Okay, I have to have a hug. And I want to see that name tag on after church. Okay, he has it. We have one. Look at that. Woo! Yeah, there we go. Welcome, Connor. <laughs> Good morning to all of you. Good morning. I want to take a key from Nancy and start off with a confession. I confess that even after 50-some years of ministry, 
I still have questions about prayer. Yeah, prayer. It's, it, it's a real mystery. You know, on, on one side, I hear, take it to the Lord in prayer. Pray unceasingly. I hear so much in scripture and in church about prayer. But I also understand and I hear about God Almighty maker of heaven and earth and that God has a plan. And then I get a call, please pray for such and such. We get our prayer warriors together, I hear from some of them. You know, there's this idea that if we get enough people together, we can shake up God who's kind of asleep and say, hey, pay attention to so-and-so because we need prayer. And then I hear about God Almighty has a plan. He's working his will out. And I sit in the hospital with some people and I watch them get better and then I sit in the hospital and sometimes they don't get better. You see, here is that question. Um, what do I do? Well, Tricia will tell you that I'm always the person in the middle. You know, I think both sides are right. Should I take it to the Lord in prayer? Yes. Is God in charge? Yes. So what's the purpose of prayer? Is it to make me more sensitive to what is really going on? Maybe I'm getting closer to the, tra to the, pr to the truth there. Uh, in, in watching God at work, I become more sensitive to what he's truly doing. So here's the problem. Do I take it to the Lord in prayer or do I watch him? The answer is yes, yes, and in doing so, maybe in some way I become more sensitive to what God is up to, and if I can see what God is up to, maybe I could beat him there and work with him. Let's pray. Father God, I stand here not knowing what to do. I know that you are in charge, but I also know that I am to take everything in prayer. Lord, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope and I pray that I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from what you desire. And I know that if I do this, you would lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face the perils alone. Father God, we pause now and we pray for Shafal undergoing chemotherapy, for Brandy Haney awaiting back surgery, for Jim Pusser now home from the hospital. Father, we pray for this troubled world. Almost eight billion people here now. How do we eat? How do we breathe? How do we dream? We pray for worsening relationships with Russia, with China, other nations. 
We pray that our world leaders will have the mind of Christ, the Prince of Peace, that we will deal with the Ukraine together, that we will in all pray, but also watch. We celebrate this morning birthday celebrations for Ethan Young, Fred Frederick, Chuck Schoenenfeld, Cannon Haney, and Connie Ralston. Anniversary celebrations for Tom and Julie Duger, Bill and Lynn Britcher, Joss and Loretta Rinker. Lord, we offer to you all of this in prayer in the name of your Son who taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. And now, not because we have to, but because we are grateful, let us return to God what is ours to share. Let us joyfully offer our time, our treasure, our commitment, our prayers.
Let us pray. Take our hearts, our hands, our gifts, holy God. Mold us, shape us, send us so that we might be your body in the world you so love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to have to make a deal with all of y'all right now. We had so much fun rehearsing this this morning that we want that energy to translate. So I'm going to need you to stand and have as much fun as we're having up here playing this. So it's your grace is enough. One. your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. forth from this place remember how much God loves you and there's nothing that can ever separate you from his love so share that love with others there may be someone out there who doesn't know that God loves them 
and it could change their lives. As you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Your grace.